hello and welcome to worship at Central Okanagan United Church. A special welcome to those who are joining us on Zoom this morning or if you're watching the recording of the service later in the week. And we are just so glad that those who are here in the sanctuary on a very hot uh, morning in July are here with us as well. Welcome. If uh, we haven't met yet, my name is Cheryl Perry, and I'm one in ministry here, leading worship this morning with Keith Simmons, who's back after a week of at camp. He's going to tell you more about that in his sermon. And our music minister, Sylvia, is seated at the piano right now, and we have choir members and the trio behind me, <laughs> uh, Norma, Keith, and Brian, who are playing, and the choir offering us special music this morning in the service. So. Uh, Kendra Berg is reading scripture for us. I don't know if Karen Cranabetter is here this morning, but she's our liturgical artist that brings beautiful things into the sanctuary for us. And um, our ushers and greeters, our tech team, some at the back, some online. They, uh, and this morning, Jim, Judy, and Kathleen are in the, um, in the hall after the service. They've prepared coffee and tea and something cool for us. So we really encourage you to stay after the service to have a time of fellowship. And if you're online, we encourage you to stick around and visit with those who come to church with you on Zoom as well. And uh, we would like to extend an invitation to anyone who's a visitor this morning. If you're worshiping with us for the first time or just visiting and you're brave enough to just stand and tell us your name and where you're from. So do we have any visitors or newcomers this morning? Right here. Good morning. Sandra? Yes, that's good. Yes, we need the microphone for this. Sandra, start, just back up and tell us again. <laughs> oh, it's not on. Sorry, just give us a second. It's on? There Thank we you. go, Sandra. Thank you. Okay, let me start again. My name is Sandra Plank. I was baptized in St. Paul's United Church many, many years ago. I'm visiting from Medicine Hat, Alberta, and I'm in town to celebrate my parents' 60th wedding anniversary on, it was this past Thursday, uh, Bob Plank and Inga Plank, 60 wow. years of marriage. Congratulations, Bob and Inga. Wow, what a milestone. <laughs> oh, there's one over here. Introduce someone. Uh, no. no, my name is Benita. I've been away for a while. Um, and what a delight it is to come here and see you. <laughs> Welcome home, Cheryl. Oh, thank you, Benita. <laughs> yeah. uh, Good morning. I'm happy to have my girlfriend from California visiting, Rhonda. Great. Wonderful. Hey, Shelley. I think you might take the prize as being the furthest to church this morning. Anybody beat that? <laughs> California. And over, oh, back here, had another. No. <laughs> she made me. <laughs> my name is Lorraine Tolanich, um, formerly Lorraine Tupman, and I grew up in Kelowna. And I've attended this church since I was six and sang in the choir with Ruth Clark. Lots of memories. And I come back every summer and love to come home and come to First United and see Cheryl <laughs> and many friends. Uh, great. great to have you with us, Lorraine. <laughs> Thank you, My neighbor from Bluebird Road. <laughs> Ah, uh, great. Well, we just are so pleased to have you joining us and do encourage you to stay after the service. And we've mentioned that Bob and Inga are celebrating something special. We have somebody else in the room. Uh, I think she's still in the room. No. Well, when you see her at coffee, you must wish a happy birthday to our Islin Vernay. She turned 14 today. Today? Yeah. <laughs> so do wish her a happy birthday. When we are gathered for worship uh, in the early church, when people gathered for worship, people exchanged the sign of peace with one another. And this morning we encourage you to greet one another, those in the pews next to you, in whatever way feels comfortable. Maybe it's a handshake, a hug if you really know that person well, a bow, a smile. So, beloved, 
Church, we are one in Christ, the peace of Christ who unites us in love and discipleship. Be with you all. Let us greet one another with signs of peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. <laughs> Welcome back. I Thanks. know it wasn't a week off, but no, you know. Welcome, my friends. My name is Keith Simmons, and I am one of many people in ministry here at Central Okanagan United Church. I just spent a week at Camp Coolery, which is a United Church camp on Kootenai Lake, uh, across from Six Mile, a little north of Nelson. Boat access only because the railway decided it wasn't in the passenger business anymore. So, so there with 38 teenagers, uh, I, we call it a co-ed camp. So you can imagine the different levels of energy and, and joy and trauma and drama that would go on at the camp. It was a wonderful experience. It was great to be there. I've been going there on and off the last 20 years to be part of that camp. And when we were there, we too acknowledged the land there. We acknowledged that on that land, that particular territory, the lakes, the Arrow Lakes, the Kootenai Lakes, there were a number of people who used that as their main form of transportation in the days before colonization. In particular, in the area around Nelson, there were the Sinaiks people who have only recently been rediscovered by the federal government, who had hoped they were extinct, but they weren't. Uh, they just moved to Northport because it was safer for them but that's part of their traditional territory. And they've won their status back at the Supreme Court of Canada. It's also a place where the Tanaha, who come from the East Kootenai, what we call the East Kootenai territory, would come and they would fish and hunt and be part of that land. Also a place where the Shikwema, or what we call the Shushwap, those people would come and be part of that territory. And also a place where the Silks, or our territory, the Okanagan people would go to. And so we acknowledge in the morning before worship that we are on the land and traditional territory of people who knew that the land couldn't sustain prolonged impact from anybody, but needed to be a place where we moved across and shared in the land and the relationships. Uh, what we would call a nomadic people, which for us would signify no civilization, for them signified living in relationship with creation and not resting too heavily on any part of it. So I bring you greetings from Camp Kootenai, are from Camp Coolery on Kootenai Lake. And also I wanted to bring to you some teachings that I had from Cowichan tribes elders when I resided in Duncan in the Cowichan territory. In that territory, when they were talking to us, teaching us about the land before colonization, they talked about being able to live together in a village. And what does it need for a small, smaller group of people to live together as one people in a village where, you know, sometimes there's a little drama, sometimes there's a little excitement, interpersonal relationships. They talked about four values, the values of love, generosity, kindness, and respect, being the central place for each person who lived and resided within that community. To always put before themselves the question, is, is this loving, is it generous, is it kind, and is it respectful? So those teachings that were given to me from the Kautzen tribes, from the elders there, I bring here as well, to think, how do we form community? How do we build God's temple in a way that is reflected in all of our living? To think about love and generosity and kindness and respect. When I first heard those teachings, I thought to myself, I think I've heard those someplace else. Hmm, I wonder where. We come to this house of worship bringing our whole selves, our bodies, 
such as they are, youthful bodies full of exuberance and energy and wiggles, and bodies with aches and other signs of aging, minds full of racing thoughts, concerns, emotions, some on the surface, some buried deeper. The God who created us rejoices that we have come, just as we are. So let us center ourselves, turning our hearts towards the one who loves us. And as we come to worship, we sing together, Oh, a song must rise. Please stand as you're able. Your parts are in bold. Come all us beings, come now and offer. Come now and offer love. Come now and offer, come now and offer kindness. Come now and offer. Come now and offer generosity. Come now and offer. Come now and offer respect. Come now and worship. Come now and worship in abundance. Our opening hymn is in more voices, the smaller hymn book in your pew if you want to follow the music. The words will be on the screen. Come touch our hearts.
you please join together in the opening prayer. Loving, calling, sustaining one, we live our entire being centered in you. Help us to remember we are yours and you are ours, that all are messengers of love's abundance. Help us to trust in your love, opening our hands, emptying them and giving, readying them to receive. Amen. I invite Cheryl. I'm going to invite some children and young people to come and join me at the front for a few minutes. I have some things to show you. So come sit here on the floor so that you can see. If you sit here, then I can show them to you and everybody can see. Great. Hello. <laughs> I've seen some growth already since I've been away and this summer. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. Come on in. Do you want to come and sit right down here so that I'm going to show you some things in here and then you'll see them. Yes. Great. Awesome. Well, what I have in my bag here is I have some boxes I'm going to show you and see if you can help me uh, recognize what kind of box this is and what might be inside it. So I wonder if anybody recognizes this kind of box and do you know what would be inside it? Aiden? Shoes. It's a shoe box. You're right. Shall we open it up and see? If they're... You're right. There's shoes inside this box. Yeah. So this is called a shoe box. Right. Okay. This one might be a little bit harder. What do you think might be in uh, this box? Ooh. This one here. What do you think? What kind of box is this? <laughs> It is. It might be a gift box for somebody's birthday. What do you think might be inside? It could be a necklace. That's a lovely gift to give someone for their birthday. Some kind of jewelry. Something small you're thinking. You two are smiling because you know what is normally in this box, don't you? No? <laughs> Party's chocolates. <laughs> but um, <gasps> they're not in. Did somebody take the chocolates? So that's a, that's a gift box. Okay, here's another kind of box. Let's see if you recognize this one. What do you think? What kind of box is this? A jewelry box. You are absolutely right. It's kind of fancy, isn't it? For fancy things. And so inside is some jewelry. Yeah. Yeah. So you put special things, treasures inside there. Maybe the necklace that you got for your birthday. Yeah. <coughs> you were. Okay. You were going to guess that. That's right. That inside you might put the necklace that you got. That's right. Okay, I have one more box to show you, and it's back here. It, maybe you noticed it. Maybe you've been wondering what's under this blanket here. Okay. Oh. Ever seen a box like this before? No. Well, I tell you, this is, uh, this is what they call a replica. You know how um, when you have a little figurine or maybe a matchbox car, it's not the real car, it's a, it stands in for it. So this is... This is a, a replica of a, a very special box that the Israelite people had. <clears throat> it's called the Ark of the Covenant. And so it's not the real thing. Don't worry, no Indiana Jones this morning. <clears throat> But this is maybe uh, somebody's idea of what it would look like. It was much bigger than this one here. You can see that it took four people to carry. Do you see the, uh, the sticks that are poking out of the box? They were what they put on their shoulders to carry it. So it was very big. And it was very heavy because it was made out of, can anyone guess from the, the box there? What was it made out of? What? It might have been, but it had something else on the outside of it. Um, gold. Yeah, yeah, so you notice the things on the top. So yes, the box was made of gold or it had gold uh, on it. And that's partly what made it heavy. And then on the very top, you've already noticed, Aiden, those things, do, do you know what they are? Can you guess? They kind of look like owls, but they're actually angels. And so in this picture, maybe they look more like angels. Do they look more like angels? Yes. So a gold box with angels on the top. What do you think was inside that box? Something special. Good guess. Anybody know what was inside that box? Do you want to look? That's a good idea that you might put the ashes or of somebody who died. Those would be very precious, something that you treasure so much. And people do that, don't they? They have special boxes or urns they put ashes in. Good guess. Yeah, yeah, sometimes. Well, do you want to have a look and see what's inside the box? Okay, let's look. <laughs> it's not the pretty chocolates, <laughs> but we'll have a look. 
All right, I'm going to bring it down on this side and maybe uh, get your help to just lift the lid. Do you want to do that? Let's lift the lid and peek inside. Okay, oh, okay, so what are those things? You want to pull them out? I bet you some of our older youth know what these are. There's two of them. Um, I think I know. Do you think you know? What do you think they are? It looks like a headstone, doesn't it? And it was a stone or a tablet, but on it was written not the name of somebody who died, but some laws. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, what were they called? Do you remember? Yes, the Ten Covenants or the Ten Commandments. You're right. And these were special laws that were given to Moses by God, and they guided the people of Israel. And so they were so precious to them that they built a special box, and they carried them around inside the box. And for a long time, the people were traveling, and they, when they stopped, they would put, would put a tent up, and inside they would put the Ark of the Covenant. And today, when you go to Sunday school, you're going to hear the story about how David, the king, decided it was time to build something really special, like a temple or a very special place to put this special box, because it was like the treasure box or the jewelry box of the church, of the people of Israel. So you're going to hear more about that when you go to Sunday school with Gina and with Bill. So, um, but before we do, I'm going to invite you to go back and sit with those you came to church with, and we're going to sing a song, I'm going to live so God can use me, right? And you're welcome to clap in this song, because it has lots of energy like you do. morning. Got a uh, reading of scripture for you this morning. That's from 2 Samuel 7, 1 to 14a. Now, when the king was settled in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all those enemies around him, the king said to prophet Nathan, see now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in the tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? 
I have not lived in house since the day I was brought up, since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and I cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I'll make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for people, for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more, as formerly from the time I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I'll give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors. I will rise, raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne for his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Listen to these words of scripture. Yeah. Oh. Thanks, Kendra. So the scripture this morning is, uh, it's been a source of conversation and debate probably since before it was written and put down on paper. It, it talks about David wanting to solidify things and build a temple right here and right now so that we could finally give the Ark of the Covenant, which had been roaming all over the place, a resting place, a place surrounded by something that, that could glorify it, that could honor it, that could be worthy of the creator it came from. He talks to Nathan, who's the, a prophet that lives with, in David's household, and Nathan has quite a few things to say to David over time. Not many of them David actually wants to hear, but he says them anyway. And in this case, he's telling David, oh, listen, I, I heard from God last night. This is not a good idea. This isn't something that you need to be doing. Somebody who comes after you will do that. Now, if you've, if you've read scripture and, and read Samuel, you might think you, you know who the next person was that actually came, came up and did that. Any ideas? Who built the temple? Solomon, yeah. So we think Solomon, if you're certainly, if you follow um, Hebrew scriptures as a Jewish person, you'd say, well, Solomon built the temple and we've been trying to rebuild it ever since. People keep getting in our way all the time. Now there's a bunch of people who built a mosque there and we want to deal with that. So... That's where you would come from. Christians, however, took a look at that scripture and went, oh, somebody who comes from you will build a temple. Well, I wonder who Christians said that was. Jesus. Jesus is going to build the temple. And if you're a Christian, you would think, well, yeah. And we've been trying to build temples ever since. We have some glorious, glorious cathedrals in the world. One of them, if you ever get a chance to go to Barcelona to see Sagrada de Familia, the, the uh, Gaudi uh, cathedral is just amazing. Oh my gosh, I couldn't believe it. It's still being built. Uh, 200 years, I think, just about, or no, 100 years being built. And it funded mainly by people from Japan, I hear, who just look at that and are overwhelmed with the beauty and the grace of that cathedral. But there are beautiful cathedrals everywhere. We've been building cathedrals for a very long time. And I, it, it wasn't probably unusual. Anybody remember what Francis of Assisi heard from God, he, the, the words from Francis, Francis was a rich young man. He was part of warring city states in, in what we now know as Italy. He come home from uh, being a prisoner for a year. He decided to completely change his life. He heard God say, go build me a temple. What's the first thing he did? 
he found a, a broken, ruined little church off in the country, and he started to rebuild it. And then God tapped him on the shoulder and said, no, Francis, this is not actually what I had in mind. And Francis thought and reflected on that and then thought, oh, 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 it's about how we live with one another. It's about how we care for one another. It's about, there's a famous story about Francis giving his clothing to somebody who had none, his father not being very impressed. Uh, another story about Francis hugging somebody who had a horrible skin disease called leprosy in those days. It's about being in relationship. It, it was an epiphany for Francis, not only for people. Uh, often we see statues of Francis, it's not just people around him. There are birds and squirrels and there's all of creation around Francis. He was about being in relationship. And when people came to him to see how they too could help build this kind of community in this kind of world, they became Franciscans and they went out to serve others. He followed the teachings of Jesus in send, the sending of the 12 or the 70, whichever one you, you follow. Just go out and do what you can to help ease the life of somebody out there. Live with the people and help build community. It's not called the Ark of the Commandments. It's called the Ark of the Covenant. It was about a people trying to figure out how to live together in relationship with one another and going through the various bumps and bruises and um, jealousies and petty greeds and all the things that people in community go through all the time, then and now. And so they developed with the Creator a set of covenant relationships that said that there were certain things they would not do. They would not do to one another, they would not do to the world. And they tried to live by those covenants as best they could without breaking too many of them. Every once in a while they'd break one and somebody would break one and then the prophets would talk to them about that and they would say, look, if we keep breaking our covenant relationships with one another and with the Creator, then the whole thing's going to fall apart. We won't be able to sustain a community if we treat one another like objects for sale or objects to be reaped or objects to be harvested or objects that have things that my object needs more than your object does. We need to live together in covenant relationship to be in community with one another. So I think when I read this reading from, from Samuel, where we're being reminded once again, as Jesus came to remind us, that it's all about how we treat one another. It's all about how we live in relationship. It's about how we do covenant together. I just had a week where, you know, a change is as good as a rest, they say. <laughs> so. Uh, we have very intense uh, two weeks before that week. In those two weeks, we, uh, we were called away a little night of Victoria where her mom had been taken to the hospital with a very low heart rate and they were going to do a pacemaker because they thought it was just something she needed. And then they did a blood test and they found that her white blood cell count was so high they couldn't do that. And they tried to help her deal with that. They're really good people at Royal Jubilee in Victoria, very caring, very thoughtful. And they tried to help her deal with that. And there were, uh, they did all they could, but in the end, the infection took over and Ruby wasn't with us anymore. And so we'd had that week. And when we were, you know, we're, we're considering our relationship with Ruby and the time we'd spent with her and who we knew her to be in our own relationship, we were going back to the place where she'd lived the last three years because she'd had dementia. and. And in her dementia, wasn't really able to function on her own or with a family member, actually, because somebody had to be there all the time to make sure that she didn't wander or she didn't all of a sudden lose her bearings and, and get so anxious that she started to lash out at other people. So the people needed to be there to care for her. And there were really good people there caring for her. So when we went to her place to gather her stuff together, the Ruby we knew was the, the woman who we'd known, I'd known for over 20 years, and the kids, of course, all their lives. And we saw her shift and change and become this other person, and the person that we knew was anxious and upset sometimes and would phone us saying, I need to be out of this place. I, I don't know where I am anymore. I don't know what's happening for me. And we would try and respond with all the care we could, and we would talk to staff, and, and that's the person we knew, the person who was slowly changing to become a person we didn't know anymore. And we didn't know how to deal with that, really. So we were talking to the staff in that place about Ruby as we were gathering her things together. 
And they said, oh, Ruby, we love Ruby. And we said, oh, yeah, because you know, the calls we got didn't indicate that there was a lot of love happening. And they said, oh, yeah, we really loved her. She was great. She participated in everything. She came to church. Ruby was an atheist, as far as we knew. But she came to church. She sang in the choirs. She participated in the exercise programs. She was always there. She thought somebody was being mistreated. She would call our attention to that and insist that we pay attention to that. Ruby was great. Even when she was grumpy, she was great. And one staff member said, I remember the first time I met her, and I'm, I'm going to substitute a letter for another letter in, in this terminology. She said, Ruby came up to me and she said, I think it's time for my witch pills. And the staff person said, what? And she said, well, you know, I, my witch pills. And she said, you're Witch pills, Ruby? She said, yeah, you know, the ones that stop me from becoming a witch, because I feel like it's coming on, and I think you better... I was just like, I went, well, man, that is not the Ruby I knew. And I thought, well, we know each other in community differently. And sometimes we make assumptions about where we are, where our friends are, or family members are, based on our own feelings, our own thoughts, our own guilt, our own sense of what we should be doing in a perfect world, and didn't give time to realize that she was living as full a life as she could live in a community that was built to care for her and others like it by people who cared and really wanted to be there with her. And she actually, most of the time, wanted to be there with them. By thinking about that, how do we build that community and that relationship so that we don't bring our own assumptions into the picture, so that we can just help see people as they need to be? And then I went to church camp. You know, church camp has a tradition, at least the camps that I've been to, of you come with your camp name, you come with your camp personality, you're more than welcome to try that out as long as you want to. All the kids accept the kids as the kids are. You come with the name and the per Now lately it's changed a bit. Like it used to be, my name was Frank and I took George. Well, now people are experiencing themselves quite differently. We have uh, youth who are coming who don't they don't feel like they were given the right gender at birth, and so they are, they've experienced themselves differently. And instead of having, like it used to be simple, you had boys' cabins and girls' cabins, and you didn't let them go off to the woods together more than 15 minutes. Now it's, you don't want them going home with anything extra, basically. But now it's, it's yeah, boys and girls, sure, if that's, that's where you're comfortable, or it's the kind of gender fluid cabin, or it's the, and the kids are like, yeah, okay, that's okay. Uh, let's figure out how we can do this together. We break them up into groups of four groups. We had 38 kids. The numbers of kids going to camp at that camp are going up every year. We, there were years when we, you know, we'd be lucky if we had maybe 20 kids. Now we max out at 40 and we establish waiting lists for each of the camps that are happening there. Kids are coming to experience. Coolery is a fairly rough camp in that it's a wilderness camp. There's no power. You use propane for everything. Uh, we just got some solar power in the last couple, of, last couple of years, but for the most part, it's a wilderness camp, and it's just like wide games and activities. Um, uh, people play, and our job as camp counselors and leaders, besides you know exploring scripture together or doing some other things, that's my role, is to wear them out as much as possible so they actually go to sleep at 10 o'clock. And we, we did fairly well with that because we saved the wide games until the end, usually just before or just after campfire. Campfire, we sing together. And the closing song at campfire, everybody stands around the fire and they link arms and they sing a song about this place, about Coolery, about how much they love it. And really they're singing a song about how much they love one another and how gifted they are to be in that community at that moment where they are just held and cared for and loved. I think that's, that's really like if we could all live at camp. I said to the kids the last worship, when I went away to school for ministry, one of the things that, you know, we, we would be in learning circles in Winnipeg, it was Winnipeg, but still, we were there for a couple of weeks at a time. And I remember one of the people in the circle saying, well, now we have to go back to the real world, and I'm not sure if I, I can face that. And somebody else saying, no, no, this is the real world. This is the play the world should be. Our job is to go out there and convince the rest of them that, that, that they're not living in it yet, but they're on their way. I think camps like that, that's what I said to the kids, like this is the real world. Our task is to try and help the world, rest of the world know that you can be who you are. You can acknowledge your 
very self to the world. And the world should not be judging you, but accepting you. Should be kind, should be loving, should be generous and respectful that you can make the best decisions for yourself and it's up to us to try and help you out. If you're getting a bit anxious from time to time, try and respond to that. But know also that you live another life where you are accepted and held and cared for. And you can make your own decisions about when you feel your inner something coming on and when you might need some help. We talk to the kids a lot about, because it's a Christian camp, about the ways in which we try and build community together. We did that in chapel mostly. We have one chapel every day. And the kids plan chapel. They pick stories from scripture that they want to act out, basically, to narration. And then we talk a bit about how those stories have been interpreted over time so that they know that there's another way to see stories. We talked about the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent as a Jewish community would have heard that story as a story of human beings always trying to get wisdom, coming home only with knowledge, not being wise enough to know what to do with knowledge, screwing the whole thing up, losing it all, and starting over again. A constant story of human experience. We always think we know better. We always think, I'm just going to do this little, reach that little, and then boom, down we go and off we go again. If you were Jewish, that's how you hear that story. If you're a Christian, you decided that meant we were broken from God and God had to kill God's son in order to make it right. But it's not the only way to hear that story. So we talked about different ways to hear stories, the cultures that wrote those stories and how we could hear them differently and find ourselves in them someplace, blessed and honored and loved and cared for. To me, that's the best of what we have to offer one another in our world. Well, there are some great teachings, some incredible teachings in Christianity and in other faiths and other traditions. The core of them all is that you are beloved. You were created out of love. You are to be held and cared for. And if you come from a community that reviles you because you know there's something going on here that's not right, and you need to respond to the way you were created, then in this community, you will be held, you will be cared for, and you will be loved. Sorry. Hmm. Ruby was, by the people that she lived with, those kids were in that camp. Hopefully we are from one another, not only in this place, but on Tuesdays when we are gathered in other kinds of communities. Hopefully we are that. We can hope for it, and maybe, maybe one day, well, it won't be the Ark of the Commandments. It'll be what Paul said. It'll live in our hearts. It will be our covenant relationship with one another and the Creator. Maybe. We can work on it. It's only been a couple thousand years. Let us think of that as we pray. Loving God, you created us out of the dust of stars. Help us to remember. You breathed your essence into us at our beginning. Help us to live into it. You call us in a spirit of love to be love on the world. Help us to know that's our calling and our response, that we are always abundant in you. We are always enough in you. Help us to see you in those around us, in our living world. Amen. And now we're going to sing, I think. But I forget what it is. What is it? Let us build a house. Yeah, it seems appropriate. Mm -hmm. Or verses one, two, and four.
We are so thankful for the gifts shared in this community and through this community, through our financial offerings, volunteer time, and prayerful support. If you are new here, you may have noticed that we don't pass the plate. Uh, at, at COUC, we, uh, if you would like to support us financially, there are boxes at the end of the pew, at the end of those pews in the aisle there, or as you go to leave the sanctuary to go to the hall. And there are also QR codes in your uh, pews if you wish to get some more information about financial donations. But there are many ways to support the work of this congregation with your time and your talents. As we continue to see increasing numbers of peoples on, on Tuesday at our drop-in outreach mornings, there are needs for non-perishable goods for our food cupboard. We give out on average 600 items of groceries every single Tuesday. We keep the food shelf stocked through volunteer time given by our amazing grocery shoppers who have been Tanya Burke, Heather Shaw, Karen Cranabitter, Susan Marentet, and Ross and Sharon Hyatt. And Ross and Sharon have stepped away from that role and so we are in need of some more shoppers. A list is provided of the things that need to be purchased every week and if you want to get some more information about what that job entails, you could speak to Keith or to myself or to Jane Brooks, who's here this morning. Where are you, Jane? Oh, she's in the choir. That's why she's over there. There you go. Uh, come and speak to us at coffee hour. And we can always use donations. Uh, and especially, I think, of toilet paper, uh, peanut butter, and uh, small jars of peanut butter, and breakfast cereal. Those are kind of three things that we're always out of. So if that's the way you can help, then please do that. There are barrels at the back of the sanctuary and in the hall that you can drop your donations in any Sunday morning or during the week if you pop into the church. And we're also looking for some more coffee hour volunteers. If that's something that you might consider doing this fall, uh, once every four to six weeks, please look for our volunteer sign-up sheet on September the 8th when we have our big fair in the hall for Startup Sunday. And um, in the meantime, you could also speak to Delaine in the office if that uh, is something you could offer and she will pass your name along to Catherine Doherty who organizes those volunteers. For all that is offered in this place, we give thanks. And as we reflect on all that God has given us and that we have to offer, we listen to this gift of music provided by members of our choirs.
Thank you, choir. Choir members. Let us pray. Holy God, in this moment of offering, we acknowledge your timeless presence and boundless love as we bring forth this symbol of our gifts of money, time, and talents, may we be reminded of your unwavering faithfulness and steadfast guidance in our lives. Grant us the wisdom to heed your call to worship and live out our faith with humility and grace. Amen. And let us continue to offer prayers for ourselves and for our community. Let us pray. God of cucumbers and raspberries and lettuce and ripening tomatoes, God of fields and gardens, orchard and vineyard, God of summer heat and lightning and thunderstorms, we praise you for all you have created that all too often we take for granted and are not good stewards of. We pray for places and situations affected by climate change, especially for communities in our own province impacted by wildfires, for firefighters, especially those who've come from other countries to help us, keep them safe. For those people and animals that have been displaced by these and other natural disasters, we pray. And today we also pray especially for our neighbors at 736 Bernard, whose apartment building had a fire a week ago and who are waiting anxiously to know when or if they can return to their apartments and who may be faced with having to find a new place to live if the building is not safe to return to. We pray for all people struggling to manage high rents or find housing unfordable. Keeper of the people who neither slumbers or sleeps, please be with those who are having trouble sleeping these nights. Those who are struggling with the heat that we have been experiencing, especially those who shelter outdoors and those who work outdoors. And also those who lie awake at night for other reasons, worry, anxiety, health problems, we pray especially for the families of those who have died and for those who have requested our prayers. This week we pray especially for the family of Joe Bryant, the family of Thelma Schmidt, Donald Schmidt's mother who died July 14th, the family of Ray Sirwa, Brent and the family and friends of Karen, our neighbor at 736 Bernard, who died in the fire last weekend. The family of Ruby Walton, Laurel's mom and Keith's mother-in-law. The family of Dorothy Laurie. Doug Klassen. Ezra McKinney. Robert Smith. And Sandy Bolin. And this Sunday in our worldwide ecumenical prayer cycle, we also pray for the churches in Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Rwanda. Holy One, you who know the workings of our hearts and the ordinary yearnings that we have, we bring before you our silent prayers for ourselves and for others. Compassionate and gracious God, we offer all these prayers in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray these words as we sing together.
We're going to sing our concluding hymn, I've Got Peace Like a River. who were created to be here and present at this time in this place in this now to be the ones who come together to build a temple a temple of love of kindness of generosity and respect May you know yourselves to be the ones creating temples and when you're tired and want to sit and rest a while in the shade of it know there are a few others of us who are also engaged in the work May you know this on this day and all days amen and we're going to, uh, we switched our commissioning song to Go Now in Peace. The words aren't up there, they're in here, but it's in Voices United 964 if you, if you need them. <clears throat> Turn my mic on for a minute. You have to stay for the posting. You may sit. <laughs> we practiced. <laughs> okay. Um, Mark Burroughs, who wrote this and arranged it, uh, went to Kenya in 2009 to start a music academy for the children there. And um, he said that they were so enthusiastic. Um, and so uh, they wanted to combine English and Swahili. And so what a friend we have in Jesus turned out to be what they wanted to do. I'm just going to read you the last paragraph of what he says. The children we got to work with are brilliant, talented, and deeply spiritual. They taught us so much more than we could ever teach them. We may have returned to Kenya in 2010, and the Music Academy is going strong. 
thank you for the opportunity to share this piece with you. Every time we sing it, know that 60 smiling children in Kenya are singing with us. <laughs> 